Now I'd like to hand it over to our distinguished alumnus and founding member of the our Alumni of Color Initiative, George Madison, class of 1980. It's a great pleasure to welcome everyone to our sixth annual Alumni of Color event. Many of you have met or are reconnected at in-person reunions and other alumni events such as this. And I'm sure that uh, we, we all look forward to the time when we can do that again, hopefully soon. I was greatly honored to speak at the first Alumni of Color event. And I'm so happy to see how much it has grown in size and importance to our community in the years since. At that first gathering, it was my pleasure, my privilege to announce the establishment of the Eric H. Holder Junior Scholarship Fund. In honor of our fellow alumnus from the class of 1976 and the former Attorney General of the United States and the first black Attorney General of the United States, Eric Holder. We set a goal of raising a million dollars endowment to, to help support our deserving students of color. And I'm pleased to report that we've raised over $600,000 at this point in time, and that the first recipient will be named this year. It's really important that we continue to make donations to this fund to get to the goal of a million dollars. I'm really looking forward to uh, a great conversation today about Judge Elrita Alexander class of 1985. As you will soon learn our distinguished speakers, hers is an extraordinary story. As the first African-American woman to graduate from Columbia Law School and then to practice law and be elected a judge in North Carolina, uh, of all places in the 1950s and 60s, uh, context is important. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris has often acknowledged that she owes a debt of gratitude to the women of color, known and unknown, who led the way before her. And Judge Alexander is surely among them. Now let me introduce Jillian Lester, the 15th Dean of Columbia Law School and the Lucy G. Moses Professor of Law. It's been a great pleasure to get to know and partner with her on this and other projects. And I'm certain that you'll all agree that she's led our law school for nearly six years with focus, fortitude, and compassion, especially during these most challenging times. So without further ado, Jillian Lester. Uh, thank you so much, George, uh, for, uh, for that lovely introduction. And I, I need to point out that you're a little too modest, uh, actually, George. This event, our Alumni of Color Reception, and the Holder Scholarship Fund have grown and flourished in significant measure due to your own leadership, as well as your own generosity. And I know I speak on behalf of the entire Columbia Law community in conveying my deep gratitude. You were there at the beginning. You were there with ideas and with a sense of purpose. And look at what we've created. And um, thank you so much, George, uh, for what you've brought, what we brought to this project. I am so pleased to welcome all of you, students, faculty and staff, alumni, members of the judiciary, and special guests this afternoon. I'm really excited about the program we've created. Our focus today, Elrita Alexander, class of 1945, is someone I will admit I knew little about until earlier this year. But the, re, you know, the, the national reawakening, a we, reawakening this summer to the urgency of confronting in a more meaningful and direct and, and honestly very difficult way, our country's legacy of racism and racial inequality spurred me to examine the stories of some of our earliest graduates of color and why I didn't know those stories. 
And this led me to the fascinating story of Elrita Alexander's remarkable career and her importance to Columbia Law School. As George mentioned, she was our first African-American woman graduate, and as you'll hear in a few minutes, she felt the weight of the future of Black women at Columbia on her shoulders. Later, after many years of practicing law in North Carolina, she became a judge, and she continued in that role as a force for justice, for innovation, and also for healing in her community. Our alumni of color gatherings have helped us to create and sustain a multi-generational community of support and encouragement. And we've also had the privilege of highlighting the contributions of women and men whose personal histories can serve as an enduring model and a reminder of the struggle that's far from over. The legal profession and the justice system are stronger and more fair when those on both sides of the table share life experiences and represent the community at large. Judge Alexander is such a person and her legacy is one we should, indeed we must know and celebrate. To help us learn more about Judge Alexander, I'm thrilled that we have Dr. Virginia Summy with us today. Dr. Summy is a historian based in Greensboro, North Carolina, Judge Alexander's hometown, and, and she's currently at work on a biography of Judge Alexander. After Dr. Summy's talk, we'll welcome a distinguished panel of discussants led by our very own Professor Kim Crenshaw and featuring Judge Priscilla Hall, Justice James Perry, and Clerkships Dean Andrea Saavedra, all CLS alumni, to reflect on Judge Alexander's pathbreaking legacy and its implications in considering the future of the modern judiciary. It was also important that we connect with those whose paths have been inexorably shaped by the trail Judge Alexander blazed, including Justice Patricia Timmons Goodson, the first African-American woman to serve on the Supreme Court of North Carolina, who also joins us today. Greensboro is also significant to us because it, that is the home of Elon Law School, which was led for many years by our alumnus, George Johnson Jr., a towering figure in the North Carolina legal community and who recently passed away. We had hoped he would join us today and I know we all share in sending our condolences to his loved ones. Thank you all once again for taking the time to join us today. And now it's my pleasure to hand the virtual podium over to Ginny Summy. Hello, uh, thank you so much, Dean Lester. And thank you so much to everybody at Columbia Law School who has been involved in putting this together, um, especially Nancy Goldfarb, who has been just so wonderful to work with and so supportive of uh, this work on Judge Alexander. So I'm gonna do a brief presentation, a brief overview of her life and uh, before going over to uh, Dr. Crenshaw and the panelists. Uh, so if we can go to the first slide. So this is a picture of the Melton family. Elrita Narcissus Melton was born on March 21st, 1919 in Smithfield, North Carolina. Uh, her father, JC, was a Baptist minister and her mother, Elaine, was a teacher. And you can see young, young Elrita there uh, just over her mother's shoulder. Uh, they moved to Greensboro, North Carolina when she was 12 years old and she attended Dudley High School and then North Carolina A&T State University, both here in Greensboro. And it was at North Carolina A&T where she met her, her first husband, Gerardo Tony Alexander. They wed when she was just 19 years old. He went on to uh, medical school at Meharry in Nashville, Tennessee, eventually becoming a surgeon at the segregated hospital here in Greensboro, L. Richardson. And in 1943, she volunteered on a Greensboro City Council race of a man named Reverend Robert Sharp, uh, who she called a perennial, uh, a perennial runner and a perennial loser. Um, but she wanted to get involved in local politics. Uh, at the time, other uh, candidates were paying people for their votes and Sharp did not and he subsequently lost. Alexander was so upset that Reverend Sharp told her to do something about it and brought her a copy of Blackstone's commentaries on the law. So that was her initial inspiration for going to law school. Her husband, Tony, was not originally supportive, 
but uh, he was a uh, he was from New York, and he said that if she went to law school, that she had to go to New York and live with his mother during um, during the time she was in law school. Next slide. So Elrita Alexander started Columbia in the summer of 1943, and she entered an accelerated program implemented during World War II. It was initially started to get men through law school quickly before going off to war, but a lot of women took advantage of it. In fact, uh, Judge Alexander's first year class was 43% women. And of course, she was the only African-American woman. Uh, the dean of the law school at the time was Young Smith, and he was very encouraging of Alexander and wanted her to succeed. However, as she detailed in her oral histories, uh, he also freaked her out a little bit early by telling her that she was the first woman of her race to be admitted to the law school and that her performance could determine the future of other Black women at Columbia Law. Alexander said that it felt like they put the weight of a whole race of people on me, but she was ultimately quite academically successful. In 1945, she wrote a paper entitled A Student's Plan for Peace in Professor Paul Hayes's International Labor Law course. And the paper was so impressive, he made it required reading for his course. Uh, Professor Hayes also went on to become a judge on the Second Circuit. But it was also during her first extended time outside of the South that um, Alexander learned a lot about race. Despite growing up in the Jim Crow South, um, it was a wake up call for her. Alexander had two white grandparents, one on each side. And so she knew that her light skin and concepts of colorism affected the way she was treated in the South, but it became even more apparent in New York. One of her best friends at Columbia was a fellow law student named Herman Taylor, who was an African-American man from Virginia and was darker skinned. Alexander would often bring him to parties where he, she was invited and he was not. Eventually, she confronted one of her white friends at Columbia saying, you love me in spite of the fact that I am a Negro, but I want you to know that I have been a Negro all of my life and I will never disclaim this. You must see me as I am. I'm not going to live on the other side. Uh, Alexander said that her white friends at Columbia who had very little experience with African-Americans, quote, just couldn't seem to understand how this girl with so many talents and such fair skin, how she could be identified with Negroes, unquote. And so she was determined to show her new white friends just how talented a black woman could be. And it was particularly during this time in New York that she decided to really embrace her blackness and use that as a, um, and use that position as an advocate for other African-Americans, particularly African-American women. After graduation, she passed the New York bar and her first job was at the law firm of Dreyer and Stevens, where uh, an attorney in Harlem, Hope Stevens was her mentor. North Carolina, her home state, on the other hand, made it very difficult for African Americans to even take the bar. She had to be declared exceptionally meritorious or practice law in another state for five years. So she had several high profile legal scholars, including Dean Smith, testify that she was indeed exceptionally meritorious. And she was accepted into the North Carolina bar finally in 1947, or 1947. Yes. Almost immediately upon returning home to Greensboro, where she was the first black woman in the state to practice law, uh, she honed her courtroom performance. Um, what I call her in the book, her, uh, her unique performance activism. Uh, she would, in front of white, male judges and attorneys, she would say, I am going to see what the difference is between this white water and this colored water and drink from the white water fountain. Or she would, um, in court, sit in the segregated section of the courtroom to the point that judges had to say, no, you have to come up to the bar. And she would say, I'm just following the rule of law. Uh, she also carried her status as a Columbia grad with pride. In a golf course case, 
where she was challenged by a white male city council member. She said, I'm a lawyer, a graduate of one of the finest law schools in the world, as her way of saying, back off, I got this. Uh, next slide. In 1964, uh, Alexander tried what was the longest and most high profile case of her career to date, involving four black men who were accused of raping a white woman. Alexander, who was the defense attorney for one of the men, blew the lid off the racial bias in Guilford County's jury selection process and uncovered exactly how the county discriminated against African Americans on juries. Long story short, uh, she was able to get one African-American man on that jury, and because of that, the men were found guilty, but they were spared the death penalty. Alexander said that this was the case that inspired her to run for district court judge, and you see on your screen her advertisement uh, for her, uh, her candidacy for district court judge. In 1968, she ran as a Republican and won making her the first black female judge in the state of North Carolina. Uh, that same year, Henry Fry went on to become the first African American to be elected to the North Carolina State Legislature. Uh, he also went on to become the first African American on the North Carolina Supreme Court and the first to be a Chief Justice. Being a Republican made her somewhat of an anomaly. Uh, she said she did it to make sure there was still um, black representation in the GOP. She said, I'm not a party person. I think we've lost the whole perspective of what constitutional government is about. I've never felt like a dyed in the wool Republican or a dyed in the wool Democrat. Uh, she stated explicitly that she was not a conservative and she believed that integration was the only way for black people to succeed. And even shortly before she became a district court judge in 1966, formed an integrated law firm uh, with men here in Greensboro. Uh, she, upon her win, the Greensboro Daily News dubbed her a reluctant pioneer. However, I argue that she was anything but. Uh, she was very shrewd. Uh, she was brilliant. And um, she became known um, on the bench for her work in juvenile court, where she created a program called Judgment Day in 1969. Uh, the Judgment Day program was established specifically for young first time offenders. So after pleading guilty, the judge would refrain from entering judgment and instead give the young offenders various tasks to perform, generally consisting of community service, writing reports on the dangers of their crime, subsequent actions they took to rehabilitate themselves, et cetera. The reports had to be presented before churches and most importantly, before the judge. So on a preset date, offenders would read their reports and make their case for rehabilitation to the court. If the report met the judge's satisfaction, then the conviction would be dropped from their record, from the offender's record. Alexander's philosophy was that the bench should be used for something other than punishment. Alexander once sent a young man to jail when he did not give his final speech, but when he finally did, he realized that he was a good public speaker and eventually received his PhD and became a minister. Judge Alexander also noted that many of the people, many of the young people who had gone through the program became lawyers and business professionals, all because somebody gave them um, a chance that they would have not received from another judge. Debate over uh, judicial discretion arose around the Judgment Day program, and it was discontinued in 1980. But Alexander still felt that incarcerating young adults would not provide the structure and guidance that they needed and that meant that the young offenders, many of them went on to succeed because somebody cared and they didn't have to stand up there alone. Next slide. In 1974, Alexander shocked the legal community in North Carolina by announcing her candidacy for North Carolina Supreme Court Chief Justice. This was her headshot during that campaign. Again, she ran as a Republican and ended up losing in the Republican primary to a white male who was a fire extinguisher salesman who did not have a college degree. 
she never talked about it. She was deeply wounded by the loss. Um, the white fire extinguisher salesman, James Newcomb, did not go on to win. Um, that was uh, Susie Sharp, who became the first woman uh, Chief Justice of the North Carolina Supreme Court. But in 1980, the voters of North Carolina approved a constitutional amendment establishing that all judges and justices of state courts should be licensed attorneys before they could be elected or appointed uh, to any bench. Next slide. Um, Judge Alexander, here she is in her older years. Uh, she retired from the bench in 1981. Um, as she said, she wanted to travel and return to private practice, which she did. Um, Governor Jim Hunt accepted her resignation and noted that Judge Alexander has served with great distinction on the district court bench. She has been an unfailing advocate of fairness, firmness, and compassion. On behalf of the people, I congratulate her on a great career and wish her well in retirement. And as I said, she returned to private practice uh, here in Greensboro until her death on March 14th, 1998. And with that, um, I'll turn it over to Professor Crenshaw. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I first wanna thank uh, Dean Lester uh, and George Madison for driving this important formation, particularly in this moment. And thank you, Professor Sumney for contextualizing our discussion with a fantastic presentation um, uh, about uh, Judge Alexander. So as we've heard, it was 1945 when Judge Alexander became the first African-American woman to graduate from Columbia Law School. I just want to take a moment to pause and note that it was 63 years after the first African-American, John Daniel Lewis, graduated. That was in 1882. And it was 16 years after Margaret Spahr was the first white woman to graduate from Columbia Law School in 1929. So one doesn't have to look very far to find a better example of the special intersectional barriers facing black women. So here we are, it's 2020. It's an era in which firsts for black women are still happening. As George, uh, is, as Mr. Madison noted, we just um, uh, broke a barrier uh, with Kamala Harris and hugely significant ones have yet to happen. We have to acknowledge that there's still no black woman on the Supreme Court 16 years after the first woman was nominated and 63 years after the first African-American man. So I just wanna uh, set that up to acknowledge, lift up and examine what it means to explore what a first coming in the mid 20th century uh, means to us. So in this moment, there are many meaningful questions that we want to ask about what we're doing when we address a first. So first, of course, is the question about the conditions of the delay. What do we make about the obvious gap between the barrier breaking of Black men and, and white women, uh, both in the law in general, but at Columbia Law School specifically, and to what extent do those reasons map on to the belated recognition of this particular first? Of course, it's better you know, late than never, but the question raises further, now that we're here, how do we examine the meaning of this first? What are we looking for in engaging her story? So our commentators will take up these questions from various angles, considering first her pathway to the law, and the particular texture of matriculating as one of a very few. And then beyond that is the fact that being a trailblazer is meaningful, not only as an individual narrative of accomplishment, but also for the lessons and interventions that their pathbreaking makes legible for all those who come behind. So for that, we're grateful to Judge Hall who will be bringing forward the voices of those who were advised and mentored by Judge Alexander. And then of course, there is the question of what this all means right now. 
In what ways do the race and gender dimensions that shape Judge Alexander's trajectory resonate with the world inherited by students and lawyers generations later? More broadly, how do we receive the stories of path breaking and ceiling shattering people like Judge Alexander? So I don't, I can't think of a better team prepared to help us recognize this extraordinary life and legacy than those who've agreed to comment today. So let me introduce them briefly. Um, the Honorable James Perry is a graduate of Columbia Law School's class of 72 and a justice of the Florida Supreme Court serving from 2009 to 2016. Justice Perry was the first African-American appointed as a circuit judge of Florida's 18th Judicial Circuit and later served as the chief judge of that circuit. We're also honored to have the Honorable Priscilla Hall, who is a member of Columbia Law School's class of 73 and a justice of the Appellate Division of New York appointed in 2009 by Governor Patterson. She also served as an administrative judge of the criminal division at the Kings County Supreme Court, was elected to the New York State Supreme Court in 1993, and held judgeships in the New York State Court of Claims and the Criminal Court of New York City. And last and certainly not least, our very own Dean Andrea Saavedra, Assistant Dean and Dean of Judicial Clerkships here at Columbia Law. She graduated in 2006 and held a teaching assistant position along with adjunct faculty member Harvey Miller in his course on corporate restructuring and served as lecturer in law for a seminar on advanced corporate restructuring. She comes to us after spending 12 years in corporate practice where she was a member of the key deal during the 2008 financial crisis and beyond. So let us uh, jump in. So um, I'm gonna start with uh, uh, Justice Perry. Um, uh, the story that we heard, we read a little bit of the introduction of the marvelous uh, biography. Um, Justice Alexander, Judge Alexander's journey uh, resonated in some ways with your own and also uh, diverged in some way with your own. So can you talk to us uh, for a few minutes about the pathways that you followed and she followed into law school and some of the conditions that shaped being uh, one of a few in your early days at Columbia Law School. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I want to uh, tell everybody to be safe. Uh, I read the material about just Judge Alexander and I was impressed with, with her pathway to the law school. My pathway was a little different. I never wanted to be a lawyer. I was graduated from college. I, uh, was, I was drafted to the military, became an officer and in 1968, when Dr. King was killed, is the night I decided to go to law school. Never go to law school before that. Uh, we had similar problems with the North Carolina bar when graduating. I thought that, you know, you would apply a year in advance, you graduate. I noticed Judge Alexander had the same problem. She couldn't immediately join the North Carolina bar. And in 1972, upon my graduation, I couldn't either. They told me I had to wait 27 months to join, uh, to apply to take the bar. Uh, so obviously the trend was, the racism was still there to keep African-Americans out of law school. I mean, from, from, the, from the bar, because we would be good advocates for our people. Um, I've always been a, a civil rights advocate and uh, uh, unapologetically, I never expected to be, uh, I, I wasn't appointed. I was appointed. I was appointed by two uh, Republican governors. I've never been a Republican. But uh, <laughs> uh, the fact that I graduated from Columbia had a lot to do with that also. Um, uh, uh, check on my time, I forgot to set my watch. No, but, that's uh, okay. uh, Judge Alexander was during her time, you had to take it in terms of the context. It was that bad in 73, 72. You can imagine how bad it was in 47. It was probably exponential. North Carolina historically was an upper southern state with a so called civility after the uh, Wilmington uh, coup d'etat in 1898. They became civil all of a sudden. So we had 
uh, compassionate racism. Uh, no, what was that word that George Bush used? Um, yeah, I guess it was compassionate yeah. racism. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, that's what it was. So I can imagine coming up as a, a female, it was probably even harder because um, I've never been a female, but uh, haha, that was a laugh. But uh, uh, she was uh, an extraordinary woman. It took a lot of gal and guts for her to do what she did. And I'm proud to serve on the panel honoring her. Um, and, 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 and just Perry, you know, you mentioned something that I think some of our, some of our uh, younger listeners just might not be aware of. Um, many of the Southern states law schools do not admit African-American candidates. Um, and, and instead, interestingly enough, agreed to send them uh, to uh, schools in the North, um, elite schools in the North and, and actually pay for them to go uh, away. So it was, it's kind of amazing to uh, maintain segregation in their law schools. They were willing to actually foot the bill for African-American candidates to, um, uh, to come to places like Columbia. Although as I understand from uh, her, her biographer, uh, she uh, did not accept uh, North Carolina's uh, a, a willingness to, to pay. Um, can you give us just a quick snapshot of, of, uh, of something that you recall or an experience that you had being one of few uh, African-Americans uh, at uh, Columbia Law School uh, in this, in, well, in well, actually, my class was the largest class of African-Americans. I think we had 23 or 24. Mm -hmm. And all of us were either ex-Army officers or had advanced degrees and graduates of HBCUs. Mm -hmm. uh, we, were, we were considered safe, I guess. We sort of been going through the whiteization process. Uh, and we, we understood that, but uh, that's what they thought. But that's not what we thought. Because we, we were here in the midst of the uh, black, I said, black and my proud, the revolution. And every spring there would be at, at Columbia, there was a rite of passage, some kind of demonstration. We'd always close down in the spring semester. Um, mm -hmm. That's what I remember. But uh, very active, a very active time, but quite yes, different. Very active time. Very yes. active. All right. Thank you. Um, uh, so, so, Judge Hall. Uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the most significant dimensions of trailblazing is, you know, the, the messages that you leave for those who are coming uh, behind, the mentoring, the, the advice, the, the ability to make certain obstacles uh, uh, legible so they can be better navigated. So you spent some time, as you mentioned, uh, preparing for this by listening to people's uh, experiences with Judge Alexander. So what are some of the experiences that you heard uh, from those who were touched by Judge Alexander? How did she help others coming behind her? According to people who knew Judge Elton, El Elrita Melton Alexander Walston, she was absolutely brilliant, compassionate, visionary, savvy, courageous, kind, a tremendous trial attorney, witty, wise, dignified, who understood people. She was shrewd, had a total recall memory, had the most comprehensive knowledge of the law plus street sense, and would effortlessly weave quotations from the law, the Bible, and Shakespeare into her arguments in court. I spoke to three such persons, Justice Henry Fry, who served on the North Carolina Supreme Court for 18 years before assuming the position of Chief Justice from 1999 to 2001. Judge Joseph A. Williams, the first black male district court judge in North Carolina. And attorney Margaret A. Dudley, a private practitioner in Greensboro from 1974 to the present. Each claimed Judge Alexander as a mentor and described her contribution to their respective careers. Judge Farrar remembered a call to come to Ms. Alexander's law office. He was a young struggling attorney and when El Rita Alexander called you, you dropped what you were doing and you responded. When he arrived at her office, it was full of clients who had, and he had to wait until he had a, she had attended to them. Eventually he was called into her office where he saw a desk piled so high with files, he had to walk to the edge to see her. 
She told him, I'm going to Europe and I'm turning over my cases to you. I know that you will take care of them. I'm going and I'm not going to worry. Attorney Fry stated he would never have gotten the cases she turned over to him on his own. He became busier than he had ever been. He worked night and day for months and made more money than he had ever made. When she returned from Europe, Judge Alexander was sent to the bench. He recalled that she expected attorneys who appeared before her to be extremely well prepared and did not hesitate to admonish those who did not meet her standards. Judge Joseph A. Williams attributes his meteoric rise from law school to the bench to Judge Alexander. He was one of two blacks who passed the North Carolina bar in 1975. Judge Alexander was part of a group of black and Jews who informed the DA that he could not be, expect their support if he did not hire Joe Williams as an assistant district attorney. Attorney Williams was appointed. 11 months later in 1976, ADA Williams was nominated to become a judge when the incumbent died unexpectedly. ADA Williams, ADA Williams was elected, making him the youngest district court judge of the state and the first male black district attorney, uh, district judge in North Carolina. Margaret A. Dudley describes Judge Alexander as a mentor and her mother in the law. She stated if she had not, if it had not been for Judge Alexander, she could not have endured law practice in Greensboro. The environment was racist and sexist. When attorney Dudley initially began working in the courts, people were shocked that she could practice law, that she knew the rules of evidence and the procedural rules. If she was seated in a courtroom, white lawyers assumed she was a clerk. Even when she appeared with white male lawyers who were clearly unprepared and, and who would defer to Ms. Dudley to respond to the court's questions, the judge would continue to address his questions, address his questions to the white male lawyer. Clerks would refuse to add her name to the docket. One clerk pulled all the cases she had worked on looking for errors. Clerks would report that she was not filing papers timely, thereby preventing adoptions when she was aware, when they were well aware that attorney Williams had only assigned the case a day or two before. White men made sexual advances and sometimes showed up at her door having gotten her address from court records. One said, all black women are whores, their bodies say yes, even when their mouths say no. Once the sheriff appeared at the county office where Ms. Dudley worked and asked, what is a Margaret Dudley? I recount these recollections by Ms. Dudley to underscore the struggle Judge Alexander must have faced as a black woman attorney who graduated from Columbia Law School in 1945, approximately 30 years before Ms. Dudley. She practiced law in Greensboro from 47 to 68 before ascending the bench. I cannot imagine how she not only survived, but thrived. Mm -hmm. Double, thank you so much. And, and particularly for, for bringing um, uh, snapshots of, of, of the judge uh, to us. I, I think uh, for a lot of us, we see um, pictures of what we used to call race women uh, from the mid 20th century, both in her bearing. I love the pictures. They look very familiar uh, to me. I, I love the playing with, you know, being uh, contestatory um, and at the same time uh, backing off. Um, I'm wondering if in those stories, there was anything in particular that resonated, you know, with you and your experiences. I, I was very much taken by the last thing you said, that even though she was a judge and even though, you know, comporting herself with, within the frame of respectability, as we all know, uh, was, was, was one of the dimensions of being a Black woman professional um, that race women, you know, really cut their teeth on, that still the stereotypes got there before her performance did. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if any of, of what you learned and, and what you read resonated with you in your pathway. When I talked to the individuals I spoke to, what thing that uh, sprang out to me is that she really was a very bold individual. Uh, and so, and she had her hand on the politics of the community and she knew the players and the people. Mm -hmm. uh, one, of, one of the judges says she hung out with the country club set mm -hmm. so that when things happened, she did not go by herself. Mm -hmm. She went with her entourage. So the program that uh, uh, the professor was talking about 
uh, when the judges didn't, some of the white judges did not like that program. And somebody actually bought a writ of mandamus to get her to stop it. She had to go to uh, the Supreme Court and she went with her entourage. There were so many people from the country club, club set in the courtroom that when the judge who was hearing uh, cases that day looked up in the Supreme Court and said, who are all these people? The clerk told him these are all the people supporting Judge Williams and Judge um, Alexander. Uh, the court called a recess and just never came back. <laughs> <laughs> so she was obviously very politically shrewd person. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that Margaret Dudley said was all of those issues she had in terms of uh, people being disrespectful, people being uh, uh, assuming she didn't know anything. When she had those problems, she would go to Judge Alexander and, she, and the warmth of her personality and the way she talked to her. She didn't tell her what to do. She would give her examples. She would suggest things about how to handle situations and just, and just reminded her who she was and what Judge Alexander ex, ex, uh, expected of her and knew that she could do. So that made it possible for her to persevere all these, I guess, what, 30 to 45 years now that she's been practiced. Yeah, yeah. I, you know, I so um, appreciate the, the stories about her efforts to create alternative uh, pathways for young people who were caught up momentarily in the, in the criminal justice system. So much of, you know, of course, the current conversation uh, suggested that these are new conversations, right? They were just, you know, beginning to consider alternatives to criminalization and, and the fact that, um, you know, these thoughts have, have, have happened before. Judges who are in the position have actually tried these things. And, um, you know, it, it's not for lack of creativity. It's not for failure to see the need to try to interrupt. It's uh, far more a question of whether these ideas can actually uh, be sustained. So thank you so much for uh, telling us those stories as, as well. Um, let me get uh, Dean Saavedra in on the conversation and more or less ask you, so what do we um, share with, what do we make of, what are uh, the through lines that uh, revisiting this uh, path-breaking, trailblazing, a story provides for um, young lawyers and, and, and law students today. What are some of the takeaways that we should be holding up now? Thank you so much, Professor Crenshaw, and thanks to my panelists for inviting me to join. I, I, I listen to what everyone has commented on and, and in my, you know, speaking with students about their professional paths, um, I, I hear from Judge Alexander that you're not alone. Judge Alexander and the community of people that she represented, um, the people that she uh, mentored, um, the folks that she got to know at Columbia, as well as um, in, in back in her practice in North Carolina, it, those, that was a community and she walked proudly in that community. And so I think that for the students, when they reflect on their own paths and kind of what they're gonna be looking for, they can look at the panelists on this call um, and aspire to know that there are others who are forerunners before them um, who have you know, blazed that trail and that there are examples that they're not alone. They should walk proud and they should explore the opportunities that they seek to serve. Um, I also think it's really important to stress um, that diversity on the bench matters. Uh, Judge Alexander specifically said um, that brains are not sex or color coded. And in her view, it was about, you know, ensuring that talent had the opportunity to serve in the best interests of, of the people. And I think that um, Professor Sumney really did a great job of showing a couple of specific examples of where just, uh, Judge Alexander's presence on the judiciary actually resulted in positive changes for the justice system. Um, whether it's from the jury selection process that got amended as a result of her own um, situation with the unfair trial for her um, African-American clients, or to the change uh, in the laws of the state of North Carolina that actually require uh, judges to be licensed practitioners before they could be elected. I mean, these are, these are actual changes that are a result of having her there. If not for Judge Alexander, some of these improvements that benefit all citizens of North Carolina 
would not have been attained. So when the students see these paths, I think it's really important to understand that they can walk proud, they're not alone. There's a lot of great examples and to understand their history and the history of the law school that really supports uh, their, their interests in pursuing uh, careers in the justice system. Yeah. So um, I uh, thank you for that. And, and um, I know that, that many of our, our students are listening and are quite keen to know more um, about what the trajectory of, 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 of the judge has to um, uh, frames for them. And, and I think one thing that I'll, that I'll ask everybody, and I'll start with you, Dean. Uh, so there's now a lot of conversation specifically um, about whether the rate of um, uh, uh, the growth of, of people of color in the profession is uh, amplified or, or echoed in uh, our presence in the judiciary. Um, that is really, you know, sort of the question of the moment and particularly the question uh, for Black women. So uh, uh, sort of drilling down uh, on that just a little bit, I just wanted to ask all of you, um, what are your thoughts in this moment now that we are having a conversation about the judiciary, its makeup, um, uh, what is um, the, the place for uh, women of color in particular uh, in that? What can we say um, about uh, how, how we go about opening up that space all the more? So I'll start with you, Dean, and, and then ask our, our two uh, judges. Sure. So I think it's actually a very exciting time. There's a very deep bench of talented attorneys, both um, in, the, in academia and also at the federal bench, um, who um, who could potentially uh, either be elevated to other open positions um, or as positions are created uh, will be appointed. I think that the stories in the news often focus on the deficit and, and I don't wanna underplay the deficit. It is important for us to understand the challenge in, in, before us, but we also have a number of accomplishments and I think people on the bench. Um, and so, you know, it's important to kind of, again, going back to knowing our history, you know, we have uh, current alumni, such as uh, Judge Torres in Southern District of New York, or Judge Hood in the Eastern District of Michigan, who are serving and, and have um, contributed their own examples to the students. And so I think when you look at kind of the, the, meet, the, the portrayal of, you know, there's a dearth of Black women judges, and can we bring more, more women to, to the forefront or from different um, underrepresented minorities, I'm heartened to know that there are people such as yourself, Professor Conshaw, some of the articles have raised, um, but there, there are qualified women who are ready to serve, who will be excellent candidates and who could serve. So on that end, I, I focus, I guess, more on the positive, um, knowing that we have a challenge, but there's always opportunity when there's, um, when these challenges are presented. Yeah. Well, Judge Hall, let me ask you, because I, I know there was a statement recently um, uh, from Black judges about this very question. So what can you share with us about your thoughts about this? Judge Hall, we can't, we can't hear you. Maybe you're, you mic. Thank you, I have to unmute myself. When I was speaking to Ms. Dudley, she was noting that in Greensboro now, there are more black judges than there are white judges in that county. Mm -hmm. uh, she said none of them were as smart as El, El, El Rita, but <laughs> they are <laughs> there. The black judges in New York uh, recently issued a report uh, talking about the not, well, it wasn't only addressed to black judges only. We were looking at the court system um, court wide and looking at the number of blacks in the judiciary on other layers, uh, another uh, opportunity to other jobs in the uh, OCA, Office of Court Administration. Uh, and saw that most of the judges, most of the jobs that were held by Blacks were at the bottom uh, of the uh, scale, um, that indeed there has been an increase of Black judges in New York State, uh, but, and there has been an increase of Black women judges in New York State but there has been a substantial decrease of black men judges in New York state. And that was what we wanted to bring to the attention of the chief judge. And we presented specific numbers 
uh, to point to her, to her and to the administration of where uh, these failures uh, uh, occur. We also need to note that, however, that being a judge, they're routes, and it's always political, not necessarily P, big P, but it's always political, whether you're going to the appointive route or whether you're going to the elective route, um, somebody makes that decision. Uh, and in fact, the only positions in New York State where you are elected by the people is Supreme Court and Civil Court. All of the arrests are either all the arrest are either appointed by the mayor or by the governor. Uh, so, mm -hmm. I think we have many people who are prepared yeah. who could assume those positions, but it's it's not going to be given to you. Mm -hmm. It wasn't given. It's not given to anybody. You have to stand up and say, "I can do this," and then proceed to do it. And then let me say, echoing what the dean has said. There's always somebody there who will help you. Mm -hmm. There was always somebody when I was coming up to help. Somebody like George Bundy Smith. He just he is directly responsible for a lot of people being on the bench and being elevated uh, through the various ranks. Fritz Alexander. I mean, they're just judges who were around who would say, would look at you and say, see something and say, well, do this, and don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so young people should know that if they decide they want to achieve something, there will be somebody there who's gonna be there to support them and mm -hmm. tell them how to um, work the system to get where they want to go. So uh, Judge Perry, I wanna quickly just come back um, to you because you mentioned that you were appointed uh, by uh, a governor that was not a member of your party. Um, both, both times. Both times. So I'm wondering, um, is that a bygone era? <laughs> Are we now well, beyond actually, that? Actually, Judge, Judge Hall is absolutely right. It is political. I was asked to run. I never sought a judicial appointment. I never thought I would get one because my firm represented the state and the NAACP for 20 years. And my goal was to kick doors down. And I recognize the people whose goal is to kick doors down. When they open, they aren't let in. So I never expected to be let in. So I was asked to run. So it's important that you have support. I had a political network behind me and people who thought enough of my talents to recommend that I do it. Matter of fact, I had to be convinced to do it because mm -hmm. I didn't really want to want to do it. But uh, uh, so it's you have to have people who think that you are qualified other than yourself. Mm -hmm. so you have to make sure you have uh, somebody who care about you. Mm -hmm. church organization, civic organization, you know, the grassroots, but you need somebody at the top to make it happen. And <laughs> it's political, no doubt about it. And it, and, it, and it means that constituencies and stakeholders need to see the importance uh, of judicial appointments as well, which um, is hard to come by. Uh, Dean Saavedra, let me come back. We'll, we'll ask one last question for you. And of course, I think it's the question that's hanging in the air. Why has it taken so long for us to acknowledge um, this path breaking? Why, why, why isn't this part of the history that we tell about uh, African-American first at Columbia and in the judiciary, the history tell about women first? What's, what's your sense about what makes this such a discovery in 2020? Well, 2020 is, is a significant year to kind of unearth this. I think uh, reflecting on Dean Lester's initial remarks at the opening of this conversation um, that, you know, there's a renewed, um, I think, general consciousness. I think there's always been a consciousness within certain populations of communities um, around these issues of, you know, raising stories um, of folks who may not typically be profiled. I think actually there was um, a statement in Professor Summey's uh, uh, Booker, where she stated, um, you know, why are certain these stories not universally celebrated? And I think that, um, you know, it may be that because, you know, time comes and goes, we have different classes, different changes in administration, that some stories maybe just don't stick or they don't, or they're not asked. Um, what's important, I think, now is that we're asking them and that we're ensuring that we have conversations and that we actually are building um, this network, this alumni of color network, so that we can share those stories and so that we do not lose them. Because it is so important as an alumni of the school as well, that our, our students when they join know about 
know about the accomplishments of our Justice Ginsburg's as well as our Judge Alexander's. And it's very important that um, the, you know, the faculty and our alumni have come and said, Let, let's have this conversation. So whatever led to the fact that we haven't had the conversation in the past, I think it took a unique combination of a, a historian who really dedicated a large portion of her career to uncovering this story, and then to all the um, people in between who really believed it was something that needed to be shared and to be learned as an institution and to take pride in as an institution. Um, so we, so thank you for that question, Professor. Yes, yes. And I, you know, I think we can't, uh, you know, over overestimate. First of all, as you pointed out, the importance of this year uh, being a time that we are interrogating, investigating, talking about um, our first uh, understanding some of the uh, unfinished business uh, from the mid twentieth uh, century, um, gaining insights from the race men and women uh, of that century, and and also. Uh, the limitations uh, that they faced. I mean, to lose an election to someone who sells who sells fire extinguishers, um, you know, it 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 is a particularly um, a salient uh, understanding of what some of those uh, barriers are, and that may continue. Um, uh, so I want to open it up now and uh, pass the mic over. Uh, to uh, Ryan, who has some questions, uh, I think that, that we want to lift up into this conversation. Thank you so much, Professor. Uh, so we did receive uh, a few live questions, but also a, free, uh, a few pre-submitted questions. And I pose this to the group as a whole, though some will be just for our female panelists, but in what ways do the struggles of black female students in 2020 at Columbia Law School resemble those in 1945? I, I feel like we just got a research project, Professor <laughs> Summy, that we should, we should probably undertake here and have some uh, oral historian uh, interviews of our students <laughs> also, but... Um... I don't know, but I you know if anyone has a response to that question. I mean, it's maybe Judge Hall or it's difficult to answer that question because I'm not really certain what the issues are facing the 2020 graduates. I mean, I graduated 1973, so that's been a while ago, uh, and. A, much more, and so what the, the, the things that I was facing in trying to find out what it is I wanted to do as a lawyer, um, it's probably a lot more similar to what happened with Margaret Dudley. Though I was not in North Carolina, I was in New York, so to New, in New York, for me, the racism was a little more uh, polite. What did he say? Subtle. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> so people don't say no. They just don't respond. And you have to be able to figure out what it is you want to do and how to get there. And that's why you need mentors like Judge Alexander was. So I was very fortunate that I ran into people in the bar associations. Um, when I got, the way I got to the bench even was somebody, was serendipity in when I said this way, when Koch was the mayor, he established the mayor's judiciary committee. So that's if you thought you wanted to be a judge, if anybody thought you should be a judge, all they had to do was send in your name. And if they sent in your name and your qualifications looked right, then uh, you would go through the various processes, screening, 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 screening. But, but it was opened up, the process was opened up in that fashion. Once you get there, then you know, they, they, the committee doesn't particularly look for anybody in particular, but when you're going through these screening processes, if you have not been involved with your community, if you have not been involved with the bar associations, when you walk in that room to be interviewed, either you know people or you don't. And that's where it gets back to being political with a little p. If you've been active in your church, if you've been active in your community, if you've been active in the bar association, then when you walk in the room, then you know people. If you haven't, you walk in the room, you don't know anybody and you're going nowhere. 
so that's one of the things that a lot of the bar associations are doing now, including the Metropolitan Black Bar Association, the Association of Bar City of New York. I still call it that. It's actually the New York City Bar now, right? Uh, <laughs> they have uh, committees where you can go and find out what the process is. So I think the real struggle for most people coming out of law school is trying to find out what it is you really like to do and what you really want to do. Not they're not like all like Jim, Judge Perry, <laughs> who knew what he wanted to do. Some of us struggle. You know, you try this, you try that, you try the other, and then you finally find out what your call. When I say your calling is, mm. but that requires you to actually talk to people who've been the route, listen to what they say, know yourself, and then step up, try. And this, if I can make, just add something, I'll make the pitch for clerkships only because it's a great opportunity to, you know, serve as an apprentice to a jurist and develop that kind of mentoring and sponsorship, whether you want to aspire to the bench or otherwise. Um, and obviously that's something that Judge Alexander really uh, took, you know, to heart and all the folks that she mentored through her career, whether or not they were her clerks or just um, people that she knew through the community. And Black judges in New York, their chambers are always open come to the judicial friends. And I, I can't overemphasize the importance of relationships. The time to form relationships is not when you need them. It must be formed ahead of time. That's right. And then you can look back and they will help you. So be active, be involved, uh, join organizations. I mean, that's how you meet people. And, and, and also be, get involved in nonprofit organizations. There you find the captains of industry, mayors and et cetera, and they see you there in that framework. And when those other opportunities come up, they'll think about you in terms of somebody who might be qualified that they already know that could probably do the job. So the next question is for Dr. Summy. You mentioned that Judge Alexander's husband was not initially supportive of her career. Can you say more about her family life and how it intersected with her professional career and political commitments? Um, her personal life was interesting. <laughs> um, when she decided to go to law school, initially even her father said, you know, you should probably just stay here, go to A&T and get your master's in education. Um, sorry, I have a dog right here. <laughs> um, so um, her husband initially when he came back to Greensboro and was a surgeon and was suddenly making a lot of money, uh, that's when the marriage really began to deteriorate. Um, and so it was not a good marriage. He, um, and not to get too far into it, uh, but he, but he was very um, violent, um, and abusive verbally, physically, emotionally. Um, and so really her method was to compartmentalize kind of darling clock kinds culture of dissemblance, um, type thing, except she didn't dissemble. She was very open about those aspects of her life. Um, but she was an expert compartmentalizer, um, which is just, you know, simply what she had to do to, to keep going. So, sorry, um, technical difficulties. But I'll, I'll open up this uh, also to the entire panel. Uh, this is from uh, Michaela Bolden, uh, class of 21, a student representative for BALSA. Can you comment on imposter syndrome and being a woman, a woman of color lawyer? I'm, I'm assuming, and I may need to be corrected, that this imposter syndrome is a way of describing a feeling that somehow you're not quite up to speed and that you cannot do what is required and that you, you have gone through law school and you graduated from Columbia and you, and you should be this, that, and the other, but you deep down inside sort of wonder if, it's, if you really are that smart or that studious or uh, capable. Um, if that's what it means, I think you just have to draw on your upbringing, uh, your family, 
Think about the people who do believe in you and ask for help if you think there's something that you lack. If you really think there's something that you lack, then go and find out what that is and how to correct that lacking. My assumption about most things starting back when I took the bar was when they said a certain percentage of people pass, I assumed I should, I should be in that group. <laughs> I was smarter, smarter, or at least smarter as 70% pass rate or whatever the pass rate was, so I should pass. But with that, I studied very hard because I intended to pass the bar the first time. And if that required me to study, you know, 14 hours a day for that six week period of time, that's what I would do to make sure I pass the bar the first time. So it's a combination of knowing who you are, knowing what your family or your, your support group expects of you and then doing the work. Hmm. That's amazing. Um, I just looked up imposter syndrome and Priscilla, you got it right. Uh, I never get understand having self-confidence in yourself and knowing that you belong. Uh, when I first arrived at Columbia, the first freshman orientation week, the uh, dean uh, did a genealogy of the class, you know, so many fifth generation, so many seventh generation, so many around the world, 10 times, five PhDs, 10 uh, MDs, and you wonder, what in the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and, uh, but then at the end of the first semester, you take your first exam, everybody's thinking they failed. Everybody had the same feeling. So at, 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 all at once you knew that everybody had that same sense of self-doubt. Because law school is difficult, but at least it was for me. Yep. Uh, and, and I commend uh, uh, Judge Alexander for being able to even matriculate law school and finish with all of the, the uh, domestic problems that she had. She was a heck of a comp compartmentalization mentalization person and uh, I commend her for that. For for what it's worth in her biography, I think she actually said she was treated like a queen when she was here. I think she felt very welcomed by the community. So it's hard to know like her experience versus, you know, later generations or et cetera. But I think that, um, or today, but I think what's really interesting about her story is that, you know, she isn't, she was an individual. And so people weren't going to tell her who she was. She knew who she was. So I think that if students can take a, you know, some of the sage advice shared by the judges here, as well as Judge Alexander, it's kind of knowing who you are and not, not letting people kind of shake you off their, your path. I mean, it's kind of, you know, I don't think Judge Alexander ever seemed afraid of competition, uh, given her, her political, her political runs. So the next question I, I can point to uh, to Judge Hall again, and then we'll Dean Saavedra as well, uh, and Professor Crenshaw. What is the hardest lesson you had to learn as you navigated through your legal career as women of color that you would warn other women of color about? Never compromise your integrity. Never. Uh, no matter how difficult it might be, um, I've had a job where one boss would say do A and the other boss would say do not A. That's tough. And the only thing you can do is what you think is the right thing to do. And it doesn't matter if the pressure is coming from City Hall or from any place else. You have to be able to do <laughs> yourself. So um, if someone even threatens to fire you because you have done what you think is the right thing to do, you still should do it. And you will find it will work out to your advantage. Uh, because then people know that you have integrity and it is not to be compromised. And once they learn that lesson, they will back off. In Saavedra? Uh, I feel like, I feel like I, that was a drop mic moment on Judge Hall's delivery of that statement, integrity. Um, 
So thank you for that, Judge Hall. Um, I think that navigating uh, to Professor Crenshaw's, one of the questions that you posed at the beginning, the intersectionalities that, you know, Judge Alexander had to navigate, I think for, um, for women, women of color in the career is probably the most difficult is figuring out exactly kind of your personal mission statement with your professional mission statement and finding the, the sweet spot where you really can leverage your unique talents and skills. And I think that even if you're exceptionally good at something, vis-a-vis um, -vis other folks, if that's not necessarily where you want to invest your time, talent, skills, and energy, it's important um, to think back to your multiple ident like your multiple intersections and think like, well, where could I provide the, more map the most value, you know, given my education, my skill set, um, uh, where can I help the next generation of lawyers? And I think that that's something that everyone on this panel has echoed. So I think that's probably the hardest part to navigate in your own career as a woman of color, just trying to figure out, you know, where do you want to kind of put the puzzle together, make sure that you're actually contributing in a meaningful way. Um, but that's also a way of people to help you and you're never alone. So we're going to keep coming back to that for the students on the call, you're never alone. Professor Crenshaw, could you comment? Mute it. Okay. Mute it. Okay. Am I unmuted now? Yes. You are. Now you're muted again. Now oh, you're muted. I'm doing this, honestly. Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to get it in while I can. <laughs> um, I'm, I think I'll put the last two questions together because I was really taken by the imposter syndrome question as well as the as this one about you know the greatest challenge. Let, let me say that you know part of the uh, imposter syndrome is sort of a popularization of something that's real. It's called stereotype threat, mm. um, and you know it, it it is in fact a, a studied phenomenon that suggests that if you are a person who cares very much about your performance in a particular environment and you happen to live with a set of stereotypes that um, attach to your group, the fact that you care about your performance and you're carrying you know, this stereotype on your shoulder is um, a burden, it's a weight. It actually has psychological and physiological uh, uh, effects on uh, every time you open your mouth in class, every time you sit down, you know, to, to take an exam, it's not just in your head, it's actually in your, in your body. So one of the things I've had to deal with is A, you know, the fact that you, you can't really exempt yourself out of something that is historically and socially, you know, just there, the, these are realities. And you, you can't carry your way out of it because it's the very fact that you care so much that, um, that, that triggers some of these responses. And let's, let's be clear, there are messages that come from everywhere um, that, tell, that tell us who belongs and who doesn't. Um, and especially you know, for a, a judge, uh, Alexander, in, in the mid 20th century. So I am um, amazed at what she was able to do, uh, compartmentalizing as, as, as Justice Perry said, when, when we know that, that that thing, you know, is often there, what I think about is if I know this thing is there and I know that it is having, um, you know, a differential impact, not everybody has to worry about that thing on their shoulder and we're still competing uh, and we're still doing well, then, then that to me is the, is the message um, that we belong. But here's the last thing um, I've had to tell myself that the theory of intersectionality has no exceptions. And what do I mean by that? Many times I, I'll find myself saying, well, you know, um, uh, intersectionality has done this or this has happened and I don't have the sense that um, that work um, is as valued uh, as other, other work. Um, and I have to realize, or my partner said to me, he said, you know, someone came up with a theory about that. <laughs> it's called intersectionality. It's like, oh yeah, right. 
um, the, the converging, you know, sort of patterns that give messages and that devalue some of what we might do actually applies to the actual theory that says that stuff. So it's like a lot of meditation, a lot of, you know, taking into account, a lot of uh, connecting up with mentors who, you know, people who I had admired and found out that they were dealing with the same stuff. And I was like, well, heck, um, if you're dealing with it, and I think, you know, uh, I can't imagine anyone as accomplished, you know, as you, if, if they're dealing with it, you know, is something that most of us deal with and most of us um, are able to um, uh, transcend not, notwithstanding that. So, you know, I just want to affirm it, it's real. And, and we still, you know, sometimes have to, to, to pull the magic out. It would be great if we didn't need magic, but you know, that's the reality of living in this world uh, with the history that we're stepping out of. Thank you, Professor Crenshaw. Quite a few attendees have asked when Dr. Sami's book will be published. I'm here to tell you it will be next fall. And of course, we'll share that information uh, to let everyone know when it comes available. But I just wanna thank everyone and turn it back to you, Professor Crenshaw, just for some final thoughts. Well, um, I, again, want to thank everybody for this important coming together. You know, they, they say opportunity and preparation are the things that actually push uh, possibilities into uh, a higher register. I think the work that has been done organizing uh, the alums of color uh, prior to the reckoning has put us in a very important position, you know, right now as a network. So I couldn't be more proud uh, of, of the alums of color of Columbia Law School for taking the lead. Um, and for this opportunity to celebrate an unsung hero um, who I think uh, gives us uh, insight, gives us uh, uh, inspiration um, to uh, pick up the, the struggles that we're having today, which, which are real. Um, we know they're survivable. We know that we're able to transcend uh, with precisely the kind of community building that's uh, happening right now. So thank you all for uh, being part of this. Thank you to all my colleagues um, for uh, inviting me to this. And um, thank you so much, um, uh, Professor Sumi, for this wonderful work. This has been an inspiration to all of us. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to share her story. Thank you.